Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. <clears throat> And let's read verses 1 through 4. <clears throat> and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, in a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice come from heaven. Out of, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. That's what I want to concentrate on this, morning, this afternoon. But let me share a little account with you first. He was almost 600 years old. <clears throat> and he had been crying aloud a solemn warning of a worldwide flood that was soon to come. And this preaching had been going on now for over 119 years. But one day there was a man in the crowd who had heard of this preacher of doom, but this was the first time that he was ever able to come and see him and hear him in person. This new visitor to the pulpit of Noah had come prepared to offer his rebuttals to Noah's fanatical, absurd assertions. Now this young man was a Sabbath keeper and he was well aware of the points of the faith. He had received a fine Christian education However, he had real concern for the reputation of God's church among unbelievers. He was embarrassed with Noah's fanaticism. But he was, he was embarrassed with Noah's fanaticism, a young man that had come to hear the preaching of this 600-year-old man who had been preaching these fanatical things about an oncoming flood, and it was embarrassing the church. But this unis, uni, uh, <laughs> lunatic fringe was called causing disrepute among unbelievers. And in this age of more enlightenment, Noah's message lacked validity. Why, men of experience, men of great scientific knowledge, men who had received elevated degrees and expertise in these matters, I mean, men who were revered theologians, were concerned that Noah was taking God's message of the Bible far too, sitter, too literal. He was unscholarly in his approach to God's word. They thought this man should restrict his preaching to simpler matters that would relate to, to areas of his own limited knowledge and leave the deeper, more intelligent matters to the scholarly theologians. However, something happened this day as this young man was listening to Noah. And he was surprised to hear no proclamation of an oncoming flood. He was disappointed that, that uh, Noah did not give him opportunity to challenge him uh, on his well-known fanaticism concerning the oncoming flood. And he had well prepared his, his unanswerable questions. Actually, he became well pleased when he heard Noah preach only those truths that would be fully acceptable. I mean, truths such as, such as God's love and his great sacrifice for, for this world. This young man could not fault a single word that he heard from Noah this day. There was not a hint of fanaticism. Why, even the atheists in the crowd were silenced for once. Finally, the young man said to himself, I can't let this go without exercising my expertise in some kind of way. So he spoke up and he asked Noah, he said, You mentioned nothing of the forthcoming flood. What is the present status of, of the flood in your thinking? Well, Noah responded and he said, I have preached the message for over 119 years now, and I firmly believe 
that it's a message that was relevant to the last century. But times have changed, and as God's servant, I must keep pace with the issues that are relevant to, to, to society and the needs today. You see, when focusing on the coming flood, I was answering questions that no one was asking. I began to realize that there were many other more pressing issues that demanded answers today. I mean, home and homes and families are, are in disarray, as I'm sure you know. I feel well qualified by education and experience to present much needed marriage enrichment seminars and counseling services, you know, for these people. And I'm sure you're well aware that there are many health challenges that, that the people are being faced with today. And, and since, um, since the missionary work, the medical missionary work is the right arm of the message, then I felt that I needed to provide health seminars. We need to pe meet people where they are, you see. And when you add the administrative duties that all this entails, I'm sure you, you can see that I, I am a very busy man. However, let me assure you that my faith in a coming flood sometime in the distant future is unshaken. At that time, the message will again become relevant. Well, the question we must ask ourselves was this hypothetical Noah preaching truth, or was he preaching present truth? Or we might ask, was he preaching present truth, or was he teaching precious truth? Wasn't anything wrong with what he was preaching. One thing very clear, if, if Noah had adopted such a message by his silence on, on the most critical issue of the age, the soon coming flood, then he would be denying the most urgent message of the hour, wouldn't he? Well, as God's people today, we can't even in our wildest imagination conceive of, of Noah relegating the message uh, of the soon coming catastrophe to the, to the category of, um, of irrelevancy, could we? And instead preach other messages of precious truth, but not in context of the most urgent information that people need. Could it be that we today have lost our vision and are using these avenues as an escape route? from preaching the most solemn warning of the three angels' messages that we've been talking about here? Are we forgetting or are we neglecting to preach a most embarrassing, fanatical warning message that could save a lost soul? I mean, was Noah's message more or less relevant one year before the flood? Just one year before the flood. He said he was in his 119th year, didn't he? Is it more relevant or less relevant than a year before the flood? Is our loud cry message less relevant today than it was, say, 150 years ago? Is a loud cry less relevant when the family's units have lost their identity, not to mention the warped, uh, satanically inspired confusion in regard to gender? Is a loud cry less relevant when the leaders or want to be leaders of our country act like spoiled children and possess crude and perverted characters? Those more interested in lining their pockets than in the interest of the people? Is a loud cry less relevant when this country is rapidly sinking to the bottom of decency and rapidly ascending to the top of immorality? A complete disregard for human life in the womb or otherwise? Is a loud cry less relevant when our own churches are becoming fragmented into rebellious independent units, conferences, unions, divisions? Mrs. White says in Review and Herald article, she said, unless the churches are so organized that they can carry out and enforce order, they have nothing to hope for in the future. They must scatter into fragments. That was Review and Herald, August the 27th, 1861. Is the loud cry less relevant when the supposed successor of the Apostle Peter is meeting with world leaders, pressing for Sunday legislation and rallying the evangelicals to come home to mother? 
He has also made it very clear that the Protestant Reformation is as much, if not more, responsible for the massacre and persecution of Christians in the Dark Ages. You know, there's another statement from the pen of inspiration that says it is a backsliding church that lessens the distance between itself and the papacy. That's Signs of the Times, February 1894, February 19, 1894. Is the loud cry less relevant when some of our college professors question or outright reject the sanctuary doctrine and disparage the writings of the prophetic messenger of the Adventist church? Is the loud cry less relevant when, we can, when we're told from periodicals and from pulpits that we cannot have victory over sin? Just don't worry about that. We'll be changed when Jesus comes. In other words, we will not be able to choose not to sin. But somehow we'll be changed without changed lives. In other words, we will have lost our power of choice. There's a very well-known theologian who was asked the question, if Sunday observance is sin, if I would state his name, you'd know right away who I was talking about. Here was his answer to that question. Is Sunday observance sin? He says, sins do not keep us out of heaven. If we have placed our trust in God, we are saved. So Sunday worship is not a sin. We are all sinners and some are lost sinners. Some of us are saved sinners. Whether we worship on Saturday or Sunday is never a condition of our salvation. What counts is whether we have placed our trust in God. End quote. Need I mention the more multitudinous atrocities and disasters coming upon this world and the church? I could give you more quotes like that, but I'm not going to stand up here and do it today. That's just a very small sand of the sea sampling of some of the responses from well-known theologians today. Once again, this charge for God's people to proclaim the loud cry of this fourth angel has never been more urgent than it is today. I think we're all in agreement with that, aren't we? Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them. Well, let's, let's, start with, uh, let's, let's start with verse 16. I think I'd be failing you if I didn't give you the context here. Verse 16, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Actually, I should go back to 15, shouldn't I? <laughs> okay, let's go to 15. We got... 14, okay, let's start with 14. Be, be ye not unequally yoked, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? Thank you. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Here we see the call for the honest and heart people of God to come out of the darkness of this world and to proclaim this solemn warning to others. And I think most of us have been in that group We've been brought out, haven't we? We've been brought out of the darkness of this world and our challenge is to proclaim the solemn warning to the world. And this challenge is as relevant today as it was to the believers in Corinth. Do you believe that? Throughout the history of this world, God has always had a people who will walk with him in and, 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 and truth and, and in uprightness. He will have a people who will be a mighty force for good and a highway for this world's lost people 
to chart their course for salvation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, he says, You are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. God's plea has always been to come out of Babylon. I mean, you think of Ur, uh, the, the land of Ur. Who was, in the, who was living in the land of Ur, the Chaldees? Abraham. In Genesis chapter 11, when the worship of the gods of, of Baal was practiced. And much more often than not, when God's people live in this kind of environment, they are influenced by idolatrous practices and they compromise worship because it's all around them. You put yourself in a position like that, you are more apt to be influenced by them. So the Babylonian influences evidently was so great that only Abraham and his nephew and family were, were the only ones who were untainted by it. So God's first call to come out of Babylon was addressed to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, where he said, Now the Lord has said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house and into a land that I will show you. Abraham's faith was so great that if you look at Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter, you find that he was, there was great detail, extensive emphasis given to Abraham there and his Divinity-led pilgrimage. In Genesis 31 now. Genesis 31. Come back with me there. Genesis chapter 31. Thirty-one, chapter 31 of Genesis and verse 3. Once again here we see the call to come out of Babylon. This time the call was to Jacob. It says here that the Lord said unto Jacob, Return into the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. Now here was Jacob. He was in a position in the pro where he could have the great prospects of becoming rich with Laban. And here, when the world begins to smile upon us today, we must remember, beloved, that this is not our home. Jacob had to face the thing, same thing. And you know, we were talking earlier, somebody was speaking earlier about the elections coming next week. I'm not a politician, and I don't even plan to get into that. But I want to tell you something, folks. We are ambassadors. This is not our, this is not our country. Our country is elsewhere, isn't it? Our country is heaven. And we're ambassadors here. Ambassadors do not vote in the host country. Did you know that? They can't vote. And I'll tell you something else. You wouldn't see Jesus at the polling booth. You might see him communing with some of the peoples involved in it. Bringing salvation to them. But remember, this is not our home. We're pilgrims here. We're strangers. I mean, people don't understand that. Even, even folks of our own faith don't understand that when I mention it. I have been tongue-lashed I don't know how many times since this election's coming up because of my stand on that issue. But that's okay. That's okay. I hope something maybe struck a chord somewhere. But you see, the heirs of the heavenly Canaan must never consider themselves home, however strong the enticements are to establish our roots here. The Lord sets them up and takes them down. <laughs> Then there was a third time when God's people found themselves in the midst of a false worship system. This time it was in Egypt. Egypt was only a modification, really, of the Babylonian worship system. Egypt was the oldest center of civilization on the face of the earth. They, they were actually dwarfing other nations with its pyramids and its phoenix and rich architectural wonders are a major attraction for, for tourists. But more importantly, the Bible shows Egypt as it represents a false religion. Come with me to Exodus now, just a little farther over, Exodus chapter 3. Chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 10. Here we find the call to Moses. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee into Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So once again, we, we see this call 
of the surrounding influences and the impression of God's people, we hear the call to come out. God has always called his people out of these situations. Then for the fourth time, 1,000 years later, God's people are found in Babylon because of their sins. Once again, God made a plea for his people to come out of Babylon. Come over with me to Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. And let's see. My people, okay, verse, let's begin with verse 6. My people hath, lost, hath been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Underline that part if you mark your Bible or somehow or another. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. You know, Jeremiah also speaks woe unto the pastors who scatter their flock too. Yes. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned away on the mountains. Turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. Then verse 7, all that found them have devoured them. And their adversaries said, we offend not because they have sinned against the Lord, the habitation of justice, even the Lord, the hope of their fathers. Remove out of the midst of Babylon and go forth out of the land of the Chaldeans and be as the he goats before the flocks. Now come over to the 51st chapter, chapter 51. And beginning with verse 9. I'm um, verse 6. I'm sorry. Verse 6. 51 verse 6. Flee out of the midst of Babylon. And deliver every man his soul. Be not cut off in her iniquity. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Verse 7, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hands that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Then verse 8, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. We read that earlier this morning, didn't we? Babylon is suddenly falling and destroyed. Howl for her, take balm for her pain. If so be, she may be healed. Then verse 9, we would have healed Babylon but she is not healed. Forsake her, and let us go everyone into his own country, for her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up even to the sky. <laughs> Listen, beloved, God has, God has a redemptive spirit toward his chosen people. He always did, all the way from the time of the early patriarchs down to the time of ancient Israel, and even now down to the time of his remnant people, his last day remnant people. How long will his mercy extend? How long will his cup of mercy? There's coming a time where there will be no mercy. So today, beloved, as we are rapidly approaching the close of probationary time, God yet again urges his people to come out of Babylon. Spiritual, mystical Babylon. And this, this is the last call before he brings an end to it all and leaves the most holy place, locks the door, and turns to take his people home on that seven day journey. You remember there was silence in heaven for how long? Half an hour. One forty eighth of a 24 hour day. It comes up to about seven and a half days. This call is recorded by John the Revelator in the 18th chapter here. And let me assure you that this call is intended for those caught up in the spiritualistic, mystical exercises of the false churches and its daughters. But it's also most urgently for those today who are caught up in the deceptions of the new theology, teachings, and the spiritualistic exercises that are deeply seated within the God's appointed end time remnant church. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. 
that you receive not of her plagues. The urgency of this message, beloved, back here in Revelation 18 again. The urgency of this message is greatly emphasized by an angel with great power. And he is crying mightily with a strong voice. Warning of the vultures who are prepared to pounce upon and feed upon the remains of those dying in the sins of mystical Babylon. Do we have our own professed remnant folks who are dying in the sins of mystical Babylon and don't even know it? Mystical Babylon is described here in Revelation 18 as the hold of every foul spirit. Now, there's an interesting thing that's going to happen to some of these folks. Second Thessalonians, come with me to Second Thessalonians. <clears throat> Anybody like to guess where I'm going here in Second Thessalonians? Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Okay, Chris got it. Beginning with verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. God shall send them this delusion that they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Ah, oh, beloved, the delusions of the arch deceiver will entrap many professed believers who complacently feel safe within the Adventism as they continue espousing the false doctrines and practices of the mystical Babylon. They feel safe within the confines of the remnant while exercising the practices of mystical Babylon. Did you hear me? These have not forsaken the errors of the beast church and his daughters from which many of them came. And I'm sorry to have to say this, but it must be said. Many of these leaders are in high places within the structure of the remnant church. And we must understand something. These are those who have left the true Adventist Bible-based message both psychologically and spiritually, yet are in control of the structure and its decisions. Are you hearing me? Yes. Just as the ancient people of God were infiltrated with a mixed multitude, so it's going to be repeated here at the end of time, is it not? The same thing is happening today. Therefore, the loud cry must reach the hearts and minds of the ranks of those who are at the helm of God's structure as well as those outside of the church militant. It's no different, except that it's the end time. It's the way it always was with God's church. They always had the mixed multitude, didn't they? But they always had the remnant also. Thank God for that. Now, many will be challenged, many of us will be challenged, whom they label as intolerant, And may claim that they can safely embrace these erroneous errors. Of course, they wouldn't call them erroneous errors and practices. And yet find salvation while teaching others their erroneous views. Beloved, every minister of the everlasting gospel, every sincere believer in the remnant church are to proclaim the loud cry, alarm to challenge professed Seventh-day Adventists as well as those outside of the fold. To leave and forsake the practices of Babylon. Now I want us to understand something very important here. <clears throat> God's true believers. Those who constitute the true remnant church. Will never become Babylon. We have sound counsel to this effect. But now listen closely. Many of its members as well as its leaders, have fallen prey to Babylonian practices, these deceptive, alluring practices. 
Therefore, within our beloved structure, we find today a mixed multitude. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? Only God can do it. But he has his way of using each one of us individually, too. So the final plea or the loud cry will be given to those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus very clearly stated in Revelation 14, 12. And you cannot have one without the other. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, they're one. No message will affect more decisions for Christ than this one. So, beloved, in summation, these four great pillars of our message that will be preached into all the world. Beloved, this is the everlasting gospel. It is a message that presents the loving law of God as we fear him and respect him. God's intercessory ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, the state of the dead, all of this verifies the state of the dead, you know. I mean, the judgment hour has come, when you think about it. If the judgment hour has come, the state of the dead becomes very clear when you understand that. The true Sabbath worship, we have nothing of which to glory. It all belongs to God. Give glory to God. Also, Babylon has fallen, is fallen. The warning of the beast, its image, and its mark. And the final cry to come out of Babylon. Now, beloved, before God's people can proclaim these great messages of the world, we not only need to know them, but we must have them internalized in our hearts and our minds through the power of the indwelling Christ. Isn't that true? I mean, only those who accept the full truth of God that God has given us for this time can be candidates for the kingdom of heaven. Many will give their lives for these truths. They will not surrender them. Even in the face of death. It's happened before. It's going to happen again. Where will you stand? Where will I stand? I cannot tell. I cannot know. The only thing I know is I'm hoping and praying that God will give me the strength now for the minor persecution that when that time comes I will be ready to stand and that you will be ready to stand even in the face of death. In 2 Chronicles chapter 14 I'd like to read the words of King Asa. Come over with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 14 And verse 11. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God. And he said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. Beloved Satan's colleagues far outnumber us. But if, 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 if every one of his colleagues focus their attention on you as an individual and try to cause you to sin today, their combined efforts would not be sufficient to force you to deviate one inch from your straight and narrow way. Not on the Sabbath issue, but not only on the Sabbath issue, but every other marvelous truth that God has entrusted with you and with me. If your life is fortified with the power of the Spirit and if you rest in God. So I challenge you to recognize your weaknesses and call upon the Father to direct you in the battle. Because really, He has won the battle. We still have some minor skirmishes. And that's all a part of it. But he has won the battle. And uh, you can rest in that with peace in your heart and peace in your mind. That what's coming upon us, and I think there are some things coming that's going to be overwhelming. We were told something about that in the spirit of prophecy too, weren't we? Overwhelming surprise. But I don't think it's going to be so overwhelming if we have Hillman dwelling in our heart and giving us the strength to survive.